to our next uh, speaker, our keynote speaker, appointed district judge, a district judge in 1996. In 2001, he became the principal youth court judge of New Zealand, a role that he held until 2016 when he was appointed the children's commissioner. In 2018, winner of the public service category at the Wellingtonian of the Year Awards for helping vulnerable young people as children's commissioner strongly committed to a specialist approach to dealing with youth offenders and an advocate for youth issues. Our keynote address this morning, please put your hands together for Judge Andrew Beecroft. From the beginning. <laughs> inga mana, inga reo, e tēnei whaitua a tahu, e tēnā koutou. Mihi mai, karanga mai, uh, ki te whare, e tūnei, ki te papa, uh, e tā koto nei, tēnā kōrua. E kui mā, e koro mā, a tēnā koutou. He pai ki te kōrua, ki e koutou i tēnā rā. Tēnā koutou kātoa. Uh, Talo falava, a malo e la lei, whakalo falahi atu, uh, ki rāna, ni sambula vanaka. Thank you for your warm welcome. And I would drop everything to be here, because no group has within it the power to bring about more lasting change in New Zealand than you do. I've been to so many conferences, a justice conference recently, an education conference, a health conference, but actually everything starts naught to one or slightly before. No age is more important no group has more potential to change outcomes for New Zealanders than you. So I wanted to start by saying that and just share with you a t-shirt. I've bought several t-shirts today. <laughs> and I see lots of t-shirts that young people have and wear. So my question to you is, where and when and who is in this t-shirt? This is the t-shirt, by the way, just so you can see it on the screen. Who is it? Where is it? When is it? Any suggestions? Martin Luther King. Where? Washington. When? 1963. August. He was the final keynote speaker. A quarter of a million people marched on justice. And he had a prepared speech on the theme of the Bank of Justice of the United States had delivered a dud check to the people of the USA, to the black people in particular. Actually, I told the story to a group of 12-year-olds recently, and I could see at this stage they just started to hesitate and looked a bit confused. And I realised, and I said, you know what I mean by a check, don't you? You know, where you write your name and the money and you sign it. And they all looked absolutely confused and no one knew what I meant. Now, I mean no disrespect this morning, but when I look around the audience, and I know the Minister for Seniors is here and I recognise her, I'm quite confident that most of you will know what I mean by a check. And his theme was it was like a promissory note had been returned insufficient funds. And he was eight paragraphs into that prepared speech. And he clearly thought he wasn't connecting with the group. And there was a silence. You could see his movers notes to one side. And in that silence, one of his key advisors, Mahalia Jackson, called out, tell him about the dream, Martin. Tell him about the dream. It's actually all told in a really interesting book about that speech. And she was referring to a speech she gave two months earlier in Detroit. And the media were there, but it never caught on. It wasn't reported. But this time, he launched into that speech that has reverberated down the decades. And children learn today in their schools. One of those great lines I remember where black children and white children can sit down together on the sweltering plains of injustice on the Mississippi Delta, where we, we will be judged by the content of our character rather than the colour of our skin. So he formulated that vision, and what I wanted to do today in a much less grandiose way was to challenge all of us, I guess, with a question, what is our vision for New Zealand's children? 
This is a great chance over two days, both individually with our friends and collectively, to think back and just reformulate if necessary, confirm if necessary, adjust if necessary. What is our vision for New Zealand children? Why are we here? What do we want for our children? What do we want for our organisations? And that could be a big strap line for today. What is our vision? From my point of view, I've been in this role nearly three years. It is a terrific role. I've never been so challenged and tested, but in a sense fulfilled. And I'm lucky to have a job as you do, where every day you wake up and think we can make a difference together. Here's a question. How many children, that is under 18 year olds in the New Zealand United Nations definition of the word child, under 18, how many children are there in New Zealand? Any guesses? Thoughts? How many under 18 year olds are there in our country? Someone said a million? Do I hear more than a million? More, yeah. yeah. 1.5 million? Where's Brian, our MC? Brian, how many do you think there are? I'll just guess. You're a potter or a man. Pardon? 1.5. Do I hear more than 1.5? Got 1.5 on the table, more or less? 2 million. Gee, I'm pushing you up. Actually, it's 1.123 million under 18 in New Zealand, 23% of the population. Often without a voice, certainly without a vote, without much influence. And one of the things I'd say is I think in the last 30 years we have dropped the policy ball in terms of a joined up, coordinated policy for children and young people across all areas. That's why I was so excited to hear about a wellbeing budget that was prepared through the lens of children and young people. And I'm often asked how well do our children do? And by way of introduction, this I guess overview is a really useful way of answering that question. The starting point is to say 70% of our children do really well. Some do world leadingly well. Win bronze medals at Winter Olympics, win hip hop dance competitions in San Fran, mathematics competitions in New York. We can be reassured that the great majority of our children do okay and live in, live in environments that give them all the start that they would need. There is a but. 20% are in environments where they really struggle and are in and out of adversity. And 10% are in environments and experience outcomes that are probably as worse, if not worse, than just about any other Western world counterpart. Now people challenge me on that and say that can't be, but you look at some of the stats that are the dark side of New Zealand, the highest rate of youth suicide, the highest rate of reported bullying in schools, one of the highest rates for interfamily and partner violence, child abuse and neglect. I and mean, that's the side of New Zealand that as proud, committed New Zealanders, we can't be happy with. The New Zealand today is not the New Zealand I was brought up in, Kilburnie Primary School, Evans Bay Intermediate, Rongatai College. New Zealand today is a land of much more marginalisation and disadvantage and structural inequality. We have to accept that. That's 70, 20, 10, you can use it for education or stats or health, even justice. It's, a, I mean, I've, we've rounded it. But roughly the 70-20-10 analysis is a really appropriate and realistic assessment to that question of how well are we doing. And there's such a challenge to move that 10% up and that 20% into the 70%. I mean, it's an old cartoon, but it's very appropriate for New Zealand. We leave 
too many New Zealand children behind. And in the short time that I've been in the role, I would say three key themes, three, if you might say, causes, or at least factors that influence that 70, 20, 10 result are these. One is child poverty and material disadvantage, and I'll talk more about that in a moment as to what I mean by that. The next thing is to say we have not done well in the last 40 years or so coordinated cross-system, cross-government department joined up early intervention. And again, it was really encouraging to hear the minister say this morning, that is what will characterise the new approach. And that's where you come in. As I said, I would drop everything to be here this morning because you are, you might not know it, frontline crime fighters. You are the earliest possible educationalist laying the foundation for good education. You are frontline health workers because all the work that you do, working with children naught to one, food and naught to five who are facing real challenge, all the work that you do will, if done well, reduce adverse life outcomes in all those areas. There is nothing, as I said at the start, more important than a committed, coordinated, highly skilled, early intervention workforce. So see yourself as frontline crime fighters. That was my background. When I was in the youth court, all roads, it seemed to me, led back to what happened, naught to one, naught to three. We talk about the first thousand days. I hope that the child and youth wellbeing strategy that you heard about will focus on those first thousand days. Everything in the youth court, it led me back to how important those days were. I'll tell you a story. My last day in the youth court was in Monaco. And I had to sentence a young man for what appeared to be quite moderate offences, dangerous driving, car theft, but actually they were extremely serious. What he'd been doing was stealing cars and driving up the southern motorway using the off-ramp as the on-ramp, playing literal human dodgems with cars coming the other way. And he knew that he had to go to the youth, virtually the youth prison, the youth justice residence in Wirree. And I just reflected on what I knew about him. And it could have been any of the young men that I dealt with in the last 16 years in that role. He came from a family background of serious interpartner violence. He'd been physically abused by his father. Substance abuse was endemic in the wider family. Not surprisingly, he showed very early, very early, symptoms of significant behavioural issues and behavioural adjustment. And there was an unproven, serious sexual abuse allegation made by him against an older male family member. I remember him in court saying, it happened, but the jury didn't believe me. I got the holiday dates mixed up between May and August. I remember it like it was yesterday, but the jury didn't believe me. He was still carrying that trauma. He had had 30 different child, youth and family services placements in his life when I saw him at age 16. And it's great to know that the emphasis on prevention and earlier intervention and permanence should avoid that happening again. He'd been separated when removed from his siblings. To Minister Polly's credit, when she initiated the expert advisory group, she got a group of care experienced children together. One of the things they said when asked what we could do better was, if we're removed, don't separate us from our brothers and sisters. Now, you know, that wasn't in the law in black and white. It is now. As from 1 July, sibling unity is a principle. 
That's because children and young people said that makes a difference. Which incidentally shows how important it is to hear from children and young people. They add value and richness to our policy and operation. It would be good to know, do you have structures that in your organisation that enables you to hear from children, particularly those who have been through the backgrounds that you're dealing with? I've always, I'm constantly challenged, provoked and a little humbled often by the contribution of children and young people and what they add and the value they add. Getting back to this boy, his father had been disengaged from his life at an early stage. Not for nothing are we called the most underfathered generation in history. He began using cannabis and alcohol at age 11. That is a very typical early onset age. He had attended 20 schools, 11 primary schools, been out of school for three years, was self-harming, had post-traumatic stress syndrome. He was also, by the way, a very able sports person. Was seen as a young bloke with a terrific future in rugby. But when you think of all that he had been through, he is exactly the boy that we saw in the youth court that your skilled and constant intervention will avoid happening. It all started very early in that boy's life. And when it came to me sentencing him, he said something that no other young person had ever said to me before. He said, can we have a prayer? And I said, sure, would you like me to pray? He said, no, I'd like to. And the sergeant in court, he was a pretty, you wouldn't call him a uh, touchy-feely kind of guy. <laughs> he said, well, he can't pray in the dock. And he went over and grabbed him and, and led him with his arm around his shoulder, which wasn't entirely an affectionate gesture, I've got to say, because there was no security in the court. And we st he stood in the well of the court. And the only other person there to support him was his grandmother. And we stood. And he prayed the most remarkable prayer that I still remember. And he said, I know I've done wrong. I know I've got to pay the price. But he said, I hope I get the help. I hope I get the help that I need. That was as a 16-year-old. I mean, really, when he needed it, it was naught to one and naught to three and naught to five. So he's the object lesson, I think, of why your work is so important. And we can all pray, I hope the people you are dealing with get the appropriate help that they need that makes a difference. And after he'd prayed, the sergeant gave him a hug, which I'd never seen him do in my life before. And I got off, off, the, off the bench and went down and saw him and shook him somewhat lamely by the hand. And I saw him disappear up the stairs and down the stairs to the youth justice residence. I actually went to see him two months later. He was doing okay, but he had a bad day, was in secure care, really solitary care for the day, being well looked after, playing chess. And I finished the game with him. And he saw me come, and took a, he just took a second or so, he recognised me. And he said, you know, I still hope, it's going okay here, he said, boss, but I hope I get the help. And that's the challenge of early intervention. Just about every young person I saw in the youth court, you could go back to their lives. And the real issues, the real concerns had been laid down in that 0 to 1, 0 to 3 time. He's also someone who we think had a form of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. I think that is so under, underrated, underknown, under understood in New Zealand. I think we have a whole cohort of young men in New Zealand imprisoned, and the real issue is neurodevelopmental difficulties, traumatic brain injury, alcohol spectrum disorder, ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, and we've missed it. You are the first eyes and ears in a family's life. Some of those things are hard to see, I know, at naught to one, but most times, by five, they're becoming obvious. It's crucial that we don't miss it. 
I think people will look back on us in a hundred years time and say we just didn't know what we didn't know. We were earnest and well-meaning, but it was like sentencing blind people to prison because they couldn't see. And I think they're some of the challenges for us in terms of expertise and upskilling all of us. We must have missed 90% of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder when I was in the youth court, which was a cause of real, when I look back on it, real shame. And the last of the three, and some people find the C word quite hard, the enduring legacy of colonisation, of disadvantage brought about by colonisation, with the interplay of modern day systemic bias. Now, how those two interrelate, people have read in university papers on them. But it's almost a toxic combination, the enduring disadvantage caused by colonisation for too many Māori children with an interplay of modern systemic bias. And you heard the recent justice report saying that systemic racism infects every part of the justice system. Every part, actually, I think of every government decision-making system and we need, and community-based decision-making system, we need to be aware of it. Those three big issues are behind what we're talking about today. So, I love that quote. When a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. And that's what you're doing. You're working with wider environments to allow a, a flower to bloom. So four challenges today, just to leave you with. I want to talk a little bit more about understanding the impact of child poverty. And that seems to me to be unarguable, given what we just said about the enduring legacy of colonisation together with modern systemic bias. Talked a wee bit about that. I thought I'd end with that, because just because you deal with naught to ones through to five year olds doesn't mean that we can't think through what it might mean to be child centred. And it doesn't mean that those children of that age don't have a voice that can be taken into account. So how are we doing? Another t-shirt. <laughs> One day in the youth court several years ago, and you see lots of really interesting t-shirts in the youth court. <laughs> really interesting t-shirts. Don't know how anyone thinks they could wear them in a youth court. Anyway, this boy came in with enthusiasm and threw off his hoodie and this was the t-shirt that he was wearing. Now, just imagine as a, as a judge how you would respond <laughs> to someone just standing there quietly, <laughs> looking at me, clearly wanting a response. And actually, by law, we have to engage and participate with young people and develop that. And that's what I thought I'd do. So I said somewhat lamely, that's an interesting t-shirt. <laughs> he said, oh, good boss. So I went on and said, it's a little early to call yourself a criminal, isn't it? I mean, you haven't even answered the charge. We haven't got to that stage yet. You're getting ahead of yourself. At which point his lawyer jumped to his feet and started to wave, <laughs> clearly wanting me to shut up. In fact, he bought me a second copy of the T-shirt from the Otara flea market. <laughs> but I boxed on and said, well, I can't fault your theology. But you won't know what theology means, will you? He said, I do. It's about God stuff. I said, yeah. I said, well, the good news is, as a Christian myself, I firmly believe that on the other side of heaven, there'll be perfect youth justice. No argument. <laughs> But I said, today, in the, Mon in the Monaco Youth Court, you're stuck with me, Judge Beecroft. <laughs> and he laughed, but without it all being rude, he just reflectively said, well, I hope you get it right. Now, that's a good strap line for today, isn't it, too? <laughs> Are we getting it right? 
because all New Zealanders, their plea would be from through me to you, I hope you're getting it right. And that's what a conference like this enables us to talk through. How can we do it better? Actually, there's a sequel to that story. It's a poly rural story, Brian, because I was at a <laughs> I was at a college in your area speaking to teachers and a young English graduate, new teacher, said, but do you know where those words come from? Now, some of you will have heard me talk about this T-shirt before, but those who haven't, where, where do those words come from? Any suggestions? Someone said, Tupac. Someone said the Bible. Often people say that. It's not the Bible. Sometimes they say Shakespeare. It's not that. It's actually Tupac. And I went home and Googled the words. And I found the words and copied and pasted them to a Word document and tried to send them through our computer, which is MSD run, but the words were so bad they wouldn't get through the MSD firewall. <laughs> These are the words. These are Tupac's words. I wonder if heaven's got a ghetto. And you read them, they are challenging. Can you already read those at the back? <laughs> sort of. Excellent work. Thank you very much. I mean, that theme, I wonder if heaven's got a ghetto. Now, what concerns me in New Zealand, there are pockets now of what you might call third generation deprivation. I suppose some of you, you wouldn't use the word ghetto in New Zealand, but there are some suburbs that are genuinely struggling. And I guess that's where many of you are. Tupac, I guess, is asking, on the other side of heaven, is there an end to marginalisation, disadvantage and discrimination? This side of heaven, we've got to be committed to ending a New Zealand where there are those particular enclaves of real disadvantage and struggle street. We want a New Zealand where no New Zealand child can sing a song like that. And I wished I'd known where these words came from when I spoke to that boy, because we could have had a really interesting discussion. So all this by way of just introduction, the four challenges. Number one, we'll get the screen back to the right size. Thank you, sir. That's very kind of you. No one's ever done that before. <laughs> Understanding child poverty. When I got the job, I was told you can't measure child poverty, it's impossible. We can measure rodents in New Zealand, indigenous forests, pest control, but not children living in disadvantage. Actually, we can. We can use two sorts of measures. One is income-related measures. It doesn't tell you what it's actually like in the family, but it, talks, it sets out the parameters or the boundaries of how tough it is. We take the, the middle income in New Zealand, and if children live in families that earn 60%, 50%, or 40% below the middle income, they're said to be in income-related poverty. The 60% is the widest possible figure. That equivalents to about 295,000 New Zealand children. That doesn't mean they're an actual disadvantage, but it means their family are likely to be struggling. The 40% figure is down to about 150,000. But that's one measure, income that the family receives. The other measure is to actually test and demonstrate material deprivation. And in New Zealand, we use, well, the Department of Statistics visits 20,000 families, knocks on the door and asks, do you have these 17 things, which includes two pairs of shoes, a raincoat, a warm, dry home, that the family could pay a $500 emergency bill on the spot, that there are at least three meals a week of either fish, meat, or poultry. If you are without seven of those consistently for a year, and many families are in and out of those one or two here and there, but if you're without seven of them for a year, you're said to be in actual material deprivation. In New Zealand, that's a figure of about 85 to 90,000 children, two Eden Parks full. 
that's the extent. It, 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 no one can argue with that figure, the material disadvantage figure. That's a big figure, isn't it? Children bear the brunt. Actually, I heard Mike Hosking say today that we, that we sort of are a rock star economy. You know, it's true in one sense. From 2000 to, to now, our gross domestic product, economic growth in the country has doubled. Wages have gone up. But you know, whatever the trickle-down theory says, it hasn't trickled down to that 10% of children. That's been the problem. New Zealand's growing and growing quite spectacularly economically and said to be, quote, a rock star economy, but what no one faces up to, it's been at the expense of the most disadvantaged and children who haven't had the benefit of it. And the so-called rising tide floats all boats hasn't floated all boats because it hasn't floated those most in need, which is children. And we have dropped the ball and you, daily, it seems to me, are picking up the pieces of that failed policy. And when you hear someone like Sir Jim Bolger asked by Guy and Espinel in a big interview, was there any regrets about your job? And he said something like, I wish we'd done better for disadvantaged children. You realise now that the penny's dropping. And that's, it's really only the last 30 years this problem's been a problem in terms of as big as it is. And this is a complicated table, but it's, before I get to it, that was a sad cartoon in the Dominion Post the other day, Games That Suck, the one in every four poverty game. And that's not a New Zealand that we want to be part of. This is the table. It takes a little while to understand. Over here are all the European countries we like to compare ourselves. Here's New Zealand. And this is the measurement of actual material deprivation. We use 17 in New Zealand. In Europe, they use a 13 scale. So we've made it equivalent. Overall, those percentages show actual deprivation. 11% overall in New Zealand. And that's not the worst by any means. Where we really stand out, first of all, is the over 65s. Not many of you are in that cohort, are close to reaching it, but when you do, you can be reassured to know that's one of the best looked after age groups in the world. We do really well by our elderly in New Zealand. Why is that? What's the one thing that really helps in that respect? It's superannuation, linked to wages and prices. If you look at under 18s, we're not by any means the worst. There are other European countries that are higher. Where we stand out here, and this is the point of this whole table, is the gap or ratio between how well we do for young people, elderly, and how badly we do for young people. And that ratio of six is way out of kilter with any other of the European countries and Australia. Something is structurally wrong in New Zealand. And it's structurally wrong in the sense that it disadvantages children. And I'm not saying we should do anything different with the elderly. But if we wanted to and we had the will, we could do something different for the under 18s. What we did for the elderly, we could do for children. That's why the child poverty reduction targets, I think, are really exciting. Because the government's committed itself to halving child poverty in 10 years. If that happens, and there's every reason to think we can do it, you should see a difference at the coalface. Your job should become easier. Pink red line is children under 17. It all started to go badly wrong with the global financial crisis and then the so called mother of all budgets, where benefits were 
uncoupled from wages. And since that time, wages have gone up, but benefits have been pretty stable with the odd increase. And they're hugely out of kilter. This wasn't something, I mean, there, was, there were areas of disadvantage, sure, but the big increase, it just went, to use Justin Marshall, the rugby commentator's term, bumpfa, in two or three years. And for 30 years, we've really struggled with the issue. You're at the front line of that. And if we mean business, those dotted lines show what we could do in the next 10 years, and I sincerely hope we do. Because it leads to this question. I want you to just spend a couple of minutes speaking to each other. Does child poverty cause adverse life outcomes or not? Have a chat between each other. I mean, what's the relationship between poverty and what you see? Now, you're probably quite brave, but we're all family here. Brian's got the roving microphone. Is there anyone just wants to give a contribution as to what... I mean, there's no right or wrong answer. I'd just be interested in your views. If we're talking about our vision, big picture, anyone want to have a go at some sort of response to that question? Oh, there's one right at the back. Excellent. <laughs> I always used to sit at the back because I thought that was where you never got asked to answer. It's usually the front people who are the... Tala for lover. Um, oh, yeah, I didn't put my hand up, someone else did. Um, so uh, for me, in terms of your question, um, is poverty the cause of adverse life outcomes? No, I don't think so. It's a contributing factor um, because there are, you know, a range of people who um, have struggled in early years, but where there are um, homes that are filled with love and nurture can come through that. So um, for me, I don't, um, I think it's a contributing factor. Contributing um, factor. But right. um, it's on its own, no. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fitzroy. Now, any other comments? Now we've broken the ice. Over here, boy, the people, oh. There's one over here, Ron. Far wall, you're gonna have to run, brother. <laughs> Training. <laughs> Can our next contributor be on the aisle and <laughs> right. Thank you, sir. Um, for me I think um, anything that comes, the outcomes that come from uh, to, to happen to our families. Is, uh, poverty does not come before outcomes. Uh, outcomes has to come before poverty. Um, and every successful um, li in life has to be the, uh, the outcomes. And any um, uh, deficit in, in lives has to come from life outcomes. So I put outcomes first and poverty Second. Uh, comes after that. Okay, thank you. Oh, here's a hand. <laughs> Thank you for doing this, because I would never have done it easily myself. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, kia ora. I think poverty is a contributor or a symptom toward adverse life outcome. And that's because in poverty, you can't afford and your choices are limited. So with poverty, you'd like to do the best with your child by perhaps sending them to a good school. But poverty limits you sometimes to the choice of school because either A, you don't have the money to drive your child to school. So your choices in education, perhaps your choices in health are also limited. So if your education is limited because you don't have the money your health choices are limited because you can't go to the specialist, you can't go to the GP that you want to go to. Again, poverty restricts your ability to health outcome. So educational outcome, health outcome, even kai. With poverty, even though we like to think we can add fruit and all the right things to our diets, poverty means for many, 
their choices are sometimes the wrong foods because they're cheaper. The fact that soft drink is actually cheaper than water tells you that people who are in poverty have limited choices in not only what they eat and health and education, but limited choices in life. So it's a symptom of ongoing cyclical hopelessness street for many of our people. But if you're loved and, and in a secure environment, all we're really doing is, is um, wrapping in cotton wool the effect of not having choice. Yeah, I think that's very helpful. Thank you for that. Maybe we'll stop there, Brian, because you're running out of breath, unless there's a real... Oh, hang on, there's one person here. Right, last one. Um, hi, look, I don't have a lot more to add. Um, I just want to say that I think the schools in New Zealand are fantastic, so I don't buy into trying to go to a good school. I want... My thing was with poverty, what you have are kids who don't get to play sport. Therefore, they have low self-esteem. Yeah. Because I've had kids who've had high absenteeism, and I had a sister who told me, please report it, because he doesn't go to school, and even at 10, I can see he doesn't want to be part of society. That's what I see, and that's what I think is, so, that's what poverty gives you. So you have to join, I don't really know a lot about it, a subclass, because you have to find friends. And we want our kids to find friends which are positive and going ahead. And I think that's at any school, and I think poverty takes away those things. Poverty of opportunity. Yeah, yeah. poverty, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. You've been very good. Yeah, I mean, that's really helpful. For myself, I'd say just as you have, I think poverty increases the risk of adverse life outcomes, but it doesn't cause it, because of those 85,000, 90 in the actual material disadvantage, many do pretty well, because they're loved and secure families, and it's a tribute to the resilience of those families. You know, I often get told, yeah, but isn't it all poor parenting? That's the real issue, isn't it? I mean, I'm sure we can point to examples where some spectacularly, apparently dumb decisions have been made. But I always say it's very easy from my lounge chair in Kaurori in Wellington to make judgments about other people's parenting when they're in an environment of continual and chronic stress, almost toxic stress, where it's really hard to make good decisions. You're in that, that's where you are. You're in that area where you're helping families to make good decisions. I always remember when I was a young judge in Whanganui, two weeks into my role, was sentencing a man for benefit fraud. He had a job on the side and on top of the benefit he was getting. I said to him, just before I start, have a look around the room. I made a big show of it. Everyone here is paying taxes that goes into a common pool where help can be provided for people like you but if you take more than your fair share, there's less for them, less for others like you. He put his hand up. So, full of enthusiasm, I said, yes, we'd like to say something. He said, yeah, and listen to what he said. It's fine for you in your black robe, earning the big bucks to set up where you are, but do you know what it's like if your wife's walked out on you with four kids under 10 on the banks of the Whanganui River when the mist comes down in a cold, wet home with mould on the inside, when you really struggle and you've got four kids under 10, they can't play in a sports team because they can't afford it. Do you know, have you have any idea what it's like for me? And yet you sort of humiliate me in this way when I'm doing my best. And yes, I made a mistake, but you don't know what you're talking about. Well, that was an interesting <laughs> interchange. And you know, <laughs> Three weeks earlier, I'd been to judges school. You'd be reassured to know there is a judges training school for <laughs> about eight days. And one of, the things they, <laughs> one of the things they said was, try not to preach or be judgmental. Be a judge without being judgmental. And I thought after three weeks, I've done exactly what I vowed not to do without really meaning to. And I thought I could do the only decent thing, which is to say, well, I'm sorry. 
I've just done what we were trained not to do and I'm sorry. And I don't know what it's like for you. And he said, that's all I needed to hear because it is tough. He said, now you can go and sentence me. <laughs> but it did, it changed the way I approached it. And I get asked so many times by people, I guess in the Karoris and the Remueras, saying, well, it's just bad parenting, isn't it? And I think that fails to understand the daily realities of parents in that situation which you face, which is a hugely demanding and challenging job. I would echo the word of, words of the ministers. What you do is undervalued, underrated, unsung. But you are the unsung heroes, and we desperately need in New Zealand the best early intervention service we can have to try and reduce the risk of adverse life outcomes. Because, you know, all the statisticians, they come up with some great charts. DSL1, DSL2, they're the poorest areas. DSL10, the richest. Hospitalisation for illness and accidental injury gets worse as people get poorer. So does abuse and neglect. I mean, that's very stark. You could say that rich people hide it a bit and don't report it, and that's probably part of the story, but it's not the whole story. Poverty and the toxic stress that goes with it increases the risk of bad life outcomes for children. That's schools, so you've got to go back to front now. Why schools do it, I don't know. But this old one is the poorest, not the richest, and this old ten is the richest. You can see educational achievements affected by poverty. What's really interesting, by the way, actually I can use this, I've never, never used one of these before, that there, there are three schools who do nearly as well as the best schools here. What, do you know anybody, what's the thing that characterises those three schools? Pardon? Yeah, they're Māori medium schools. By Māori, for Māori. So, doesn't that tell you that we could be a bit more experimental about how we're delivering services for Māori? Infant mortality is related to poverty. I couldn't come and speak today to an organisation like Family Star without putting in context family child poverty. Because it seems to me that is probably the biggest single risk factor challenge that you face. I may be overstating that, but that's the context in which you're likely to be working. This we could talk about for a long time, and as a grey-haired Pākehā man, I'm probably not the man to raise it. But you know, in my view, it is an absolutely inescapable and fundamental challenge. Here's my view. Pu'au Te Ata Tū had huge expectation and created just about the conditions for a revolution. In 1989, the Child, Youth and Family legislation, particularly for Indigenous children, said that no decision should be made about a child without whānau, hapu, iwi involvement. Collective. That's what it said in 89. And wider family for cultures that weren't indigenous. And in the early 90s, we heard, I knew of some great stories, a baby in the southern part of the North Island, there was a real concern about whether that baby should be removed. Child Youth and Family paid for a bus of 42 people from the Hokianga to come down in a marae, paid for them to live there and be there and be fed there for three days to talk through what should happen with the wider community and they came up with a great decision and the baby was taken from wider, to wider family up north. The social workers went with the baby on the bus and it was all resolved and sorted out after a three-day family group conference. And if you ask people about that in 2010, could that happen, they would almost laugh. 
So that's not how it's done. The point being that 89 was a chance for a revolution, but it withered on the vine. And it almost became Child, Youth and Family, the agency it was designed to replace. And that's the cause, I think, there is enormous frustration and pent-up anger within the Māori community that the 89 legislation, it was as if, some of you know what I mean, you, you know what I mean by twink or whiteout, was if in the legislation those words hapu and iwi had been twinked out. As at 1 July, there is a new legislative model that makes, at least for Indigenous children, it even clearer. There must be partnership, whānau, hapu, iwi, delegation of powers, even devolution of resources. I mean, we're lucky in a sense, having blown the first revolution, we've got a chance for the second revolution. We cannot miss it this time. I think there's a different New Zealand in that wider social services that are ready for this challenge. We've all got to be part of it. The minister's right. It's not just Oranga Tamariki, but Oranga Tamariki has the statutory responsibility. But that absolute commitment to partnership, early intervention with whānau, hapu and iwi is inescapable. And I think for any Family Start program, one of the challenges is to ask, what are our links with hapu and iwi in the area? What's our network of involvement? Are we modelling what Oranga Tamariki is being asked to do? But make no mistake, this isn't just tinkering with the old model, this is a whole new model, and particularly for Indigenous children and families, all the hope of 1989 and Pu'a Aotearoa it's time to have it again. But this time, we can't drop the ball. I talked a bit about that. I just love this table. It's one slide. On the left are all the main neurodevelopmental disorders. Learning disabilities like dyslexia, communication disorders, ADHD. Dame Tariana Turia always challenges me on that, so that's a European colonised label. But so far as it goes, you know what I mean, behavioural issues. Traumatic brain injury, epilepsy, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. This is from my counterpart in England, England and Wales. The middle percentages are the reported rates amongst young people in the general population in England and Wales. Quite high traumatic brain injury. That's something I think any family start worker should be on the lookout for quite early. Often accidental, car accident, bumpings, dropping, traumatic brain injury in England and Wales at least in the general population is significantly high. But on the right hand side, reported prevalence rates amongst young people in custody in England and Wales. Look at those numbers. I hope that a good Family Start program is working hard to think about earlier identification of some of those issues. Because believe me, the education system isn't doing a good job of identifying them, and the justice system has been hopeless at it. And I get that some of them are difficult to identify early on, but by five, we're going to have a pretty good insight into many of those. And you can go through to age five, can't you? Is that right? Yeah. It's been part of upskilling us all, and judges are going through it right now, is learning about those issues and where we can get help. Fourth challenge, and it's really the last, and it's easy to say, we talk a lot about being child-centred, but the more I'm in this role, the more I realise the wisdom of children. They challenge us, they add value. This isn't just some sort of tokenistic process I'm suggesting. All of us should be thinking of ways to embed in our organisations how we hear from children. Because it does add value. 
And children aren't just a work in progress who will be adults, who will have a voice. They're capable of having a voice now. They're experts in their own lives. This little video clip, albeit Australian, unscripted, just indicates nicely the value of children's voices. We'll just play it now. If I was Prime Minister, I would make it illegal. Why does he get five dollars? That's just the way it is. <laughs> Seven dollars. It should be flat out illegal, like, I'm not joking, I'm not being unreasonable. Women and men should have the same money. They should have 50-50, 60-60, if you want to do 120. It should just be how hard you work. If you do the same work, you should get paid the same money. What we're trying to tell you is that it's not fair that boys get paid more than girls. Maybe if the men noticed they were being paid more than the women, they should speak up about it. When I am older, I'm going to make a change. If I don't forget. <laughs> Ugh. Ugh, I have no words, it's so wrong. I was at... Iron Gate Primary School in Flaxmere, end of last year, spoke to a group of nine and ten year olds, or they spoke to me really. I said, What if you were Prime Minister for a day, what would be your big issues? They said straight away, ban plastics, stop hurtful bullying words. We want free school lunches for all of us. We want better, fresher water. We're worried about climate change. Mum doesn't have a warm, dry home. I said this just straight away. And we want more money for benefits so that we can play sport and do things that some other kids can do. And I thought, what a fantastic insight. I was so impressed, I texted right to the Prime Minister's office saying, just heard these are the big issues. And she arranged, but she couldn't do it, as it happened, because she had to go overseas, to meet with those kids. Children always add value. Hearing from children who you have dealt with, even when they may be a wee bit older, to say, what do they remember, what stands out, you would be surprised and enriched by their views. So they are really the four things I wanted to talk about. The introduction, the 70-20-10, remembering that boy's words, I hope you get it right. Thinking about the context of child poverty, and it's so easy to be judgmental thinking about the necessity this time round to do better with the new legislation for Māori. And it's all in place. In a sense, you know, the Minister didn't say this, but I would say it, I think Oranga Tamariki announced too much too early. It's only now that the legislation's in place, and it's premature. Concerned as we all might be, it's premature to judge, because work is being done all of us need to help to ensure that the new model rolls out in a way that's really effective and is consistent with the dream, consistent with the vision. Neurodevelopmental disorders, bit of a mouthful, but they're challenges for us. And how well are we hearing from children? Now, Mr Slide Man at the back, could you go to one of the last slides that's got a heading on it called The Necessity for Moral Courage. Can you go right through? Just leave all this out, because it's all what children have told us. You can have the PowerPoint, and it's all children's views, and you can keep going and stop and keep going. There, last T-shirt. It's a story. Don't know how many of you know this story, but it's got a point, and it's really interesting. T-shirt. It's not Jesse Owens in 1936, but what does the T-shirt depict? What's the real-life event? Anyone remember? No? Olympics. Do you know which Olympics? It was Mexico in 1968. 
The background is the US track team decided not to go because Martin Luther King had been assassinated. It was going to be their protest. But they went and they said every track sprint race they won, and they thought they'd win the lot, they'd do the Black Power salute. As it happened, they all went out. But the 200 metres, they were sure they'd come first, second and third. Tommy Smith came first, John Carlos third, but an Australian, Peter Norman, came second, which rather wrecked their plans. So they went to him and said, this is your medal ceremony too, we're going to do the Black Power salute, how do you feel? And he said, I'm a Salvation Army boy from Melbourne, I stand with you. He actually wore an Athletes Against Racism badge. Then Tommy Smith said, Peter, by the way, we've got a problem. John Carlos has forgotten his gloves, the idiot. <laughs> Peter Norman said, easy. You'll just have to wear the right glove, Tommy. And John Carlos, you'll have to wear it on the left hand, which breaks with protocol, but that's why they're on different hands. Pandemonium broke loose. Some of you remember, enormous controversy. In the end, the US team buckled to the pressure and Smith and Carlos were banned from the games and hardly raced again. Peter Norman ran the fourth fastest time in the world to go to 72. He wanted a real crack at winning. But they didn't want to select him because he had worn that tin badge, Athletes Against Racism, and he aligned himself with what had happened. And they got rounded in Australia by not selecting him, by not selecting any sprinters because they said no sprinter was good enough to go. He never raced for Australia again. It's all told in a great DVD called Salute. And you see Peter Norman's funeral in the Salvation Army Citadel in Melbourne, and his coffin has been carried out. You see the pallbearers, front left and front right, the coffin on their shoulders are Tommy Smith and John Carlos. They'd travelled all the way from the States because they said, this man had moral courage. He stood up for what he believed. He had a value system that made a difference. And when the pressure comes on, he did things differently. That's our challenge today in our local communities. In the words of that little boy, if I don't forget, we go back to areas of enormous need and challenge where the country needs us to make a clear stand. The courage of our convictions, our values base has got to be clear so that we can make a difference with the families and for the children that we're working with. That's an enduring challenge, but today's a chance to construct that vision afresh and encourage each other. And I hope we can do that. I can stay to about lunchtime. I'm sorry I can't stay for the whole two days. But thank you, as Children's Commissioner, on behalf of the 1.123 million children in New Zealand, thank you for what you do. And just to conclude on a different note, Usually at this time, people say to me, thank you, Judge, you can shut up now, but actually there's a lot quicker way of solving all of this problem. <laughs> and I'll close with this video. It's the next one on the slide, sir. Next one, next one. Yeah, this one. This, I'm told, is the real solution. If only it were that easy. <laughs> <laughs>